Okay, so this, is, this tells again about Stuart's fruitless odyssey. We don't try to romanticize Stuart. It was very interesting, like in the 60s, um, the 100th anniversary of the Battle of, Gettys or Battle of Hanover, there were some artistic productions in Hanover that showed Jeb Stuart in this magisterial or this majestic light, this um, hero worship type idolatry. I mean, I, it's kind of strange because the Union won the battle, it won the war. But here in Hanover, in New York County, we didn't pr produce any tremendous artwork celebrating General Kilpatrick, for instance. And we'll talk about some other Union profiles and courage in a second. But we have a heroic image of uh, Jeb Stewart lumping, leaping a creek. But he was leaping a creek to retreat. And um, to me, it's, it's just interesting to think about that era, the 1960s, the 100th year anniversary, and the lost cause mythology was still very, very strong in this country and, and in this area. So instead of idolizing Stewart, you know, we reached out, we, we talked to 11, uh, 12 historians actually throughout this entire process. Each marker had a different group of historians. You know, someone like Scott Mania Sr., who knows so much about battles. Uh, we'd rely on him for a marker like this to make sure we got our history straight, that we tell the facts and just the facts. And um, the maps, which you can't really see too well here, but you can imagine a three feet by two feet uh, marker, you can see how circuitous um, Stuart's march was north and how late he was for the, the Battle of Gettysburg. And then we let people decide. We say, you decide. It's almost like the old Robert Walter Cronkite movies of youth. I don't, maybe I'm showing my age. We used to have these shows where Walter Cronkite would come on and say, and you are there. And then you'd be at uh, the Battle of Brandywine or Valley Forge or um, the Battle of Gettysburg. So what we're trying to do is let kids, families, inquirers decide for themselves. Did Stuart mess up? Did General Lee give him bad orders? You decide. Here, we're giving you the facts. You interpret. Use your mind. Use your wherewithal to decide for yourself. So we don't want to be heavy-handed with our history. <clears throat> this is uh, the Union Strikes Back. After the Confederates did capture the square in Hanover, um, and they went as far as the railroad tracks on Broadway, which is where that one image that we were talking about earlier, where you show that, where we have that side view of the commons when it's more agrarian. So the Confederates made it as far as those railroad tracks north. And then General Kirkpatrick up in Abbottstown comes racing down, and this image shows Kirkpatrick um, racing back, he, he, you know, he hears the, the gunfire. And the Union <coughs> cavalry, which most, the, the front of the Union cavalry is already up in Abbottstown, comes racing back, fights back, repulses the Confederates through the square again, and then back from whence they came, near the corner of Westminster Road and Frederick Street. And here is uh, General Kirkpatrick. And we forget how young these people are. Brandon and I were talking about this um, a few weeks ago. These are kids, you know? Maybe I'm showing age, but they're all, these are all 24-year-olds and 25-year-olds and 26-year-olds, and they're generals. It's just amazing to me. These are not weathered uh, war veterans. They're young, impulsive, brash, full of testosterone, and they're in their 20s, and they are making consequential decisions that may have saved the fate of a nation. Any other questions? Now this one needs some help. Again, this, mean, this means for placement only. Um, and this is where we, we'd like, you know, if there are any artists out there, visual artists, I really think there's a big um, story to tell. And I also think that about West Mannheim, that I would love to see more visual artists reckon with the history and create art that really brings people into the scenes. And we don't have much visual art in terms of the cannon blasts, where the, um, the artillery kind of took over Hanover for two hours in the afternoon. So we kind of cobbled together images that we have. Um, 
and all the history here is accurate, but we're struggling with how do we visualize that? How do we make it compelling history? So if there's any ideas or anybody's listening out there, we'd love to hear from you. This is another U.S. Civil War trails marker. There are two buildings on the square in June of 1863 that are still standing. This is a central hotel. On the second floor, General Kilpatrick stayed there. Um, this shows the square as it was in that era. This is around 1863. We're very fortunate to have a lot of photographs of Hanover from the 19th century. And, th and then, of course, here is a fav famous quote by General Alfred Pleasanton. Hanover saved the fate of the nation. And I have a friend, um, he actually wants to make t-shirts that say Hanover saved the fate of the nation. And I think it's a hell of an idea. <laughs> this is another U.S. Civil War trail sign that is outside the Hanover Area Historical Society. And it faces what was once the Pleasant Hill Hotel. This building, sadly, is no longer with us, but it's on a grassy knoll that adjoins the Myers Mansion, which is the Historical Society headquarters, on the 100 block of Baltimore Street. Um, I do want to put in a plug for the Historical Society. We wanted to market, or we wanted to promote and partner with them because we think they're awesome partners. So to have this, you know, uh, U.S. Civil War trail sign, and this is their, their brand that's used all over the Mid-Atlantic, to partner with them, we want to shine a light on the Historical Society and get them in brochures. So when you open that U.S. Civil War trails map, you'll see these four markers thrown out uh, across Hanover, all attached to some type of anchor. So the anchor with the first marker was the library. Uh, the other anchor is your square, um, right smack dab in the square next to the old uh, Clark's Shoe Outlet, which is a huge commercial success in downtown Hanover. And then this one is outside the Historical Society. The Historical Society, I got a sneak preview this week. They have a great museum in the back of their property. It's a carriage house. I highly recommend it. And um, they have just done a wonderful job working with volunteers and their own people to cobble together a great history museum for Hanover that's never had before. It tells a fantastic story. It's a carriage house uh, of a mansion. It looks very small from the outside, but it's comprehensive and really engaging. Have you seen it yet, sir? I have not, but I've talked to people who have been working on it. I'm blown away by it. I highly recommend it. Well, you can take private tours. Yeah. So this is, um, well, this actually tells a story. So this is a companion marker to the Healing Touch marker. This is a Heart of Hanover Trail marker. So the walkway going up to the Historical Society mansion will basically have two markers that are sentinels or complements to that walkway. And they're angled, so they, you know, they're symmetrical and they're like welcoming visitors. And the one of course, it tells the story of the Civil, makeshift Civil War Hospital. This tells the story of the mansion itself and the historical society. So it's a Gilded Age mansion built by um, one of the owners or two owners of the Hanover Shoe Farms uh, and the Hanover Shoe Company. I should say the Hanover Shoe Company. The Hanover Shoe Farms came later, actually. So the Hanover Shoe Company magnets were... Um, C.N. Myers and H.D. Shepard, they built, they're very close friends, and they built complementary, well, actually twin mansions, neoclassical style, um, just gorgeous. So one of our quests is to tell human interest stories and to tell stories about all kinds of people. And this is a very interesting story about uh, Mr. Myers' daughter, who was a tremendous artist, and she hung out in expatriate uh, France with the likes of Joan Miro, uh, Henry, or Matisse, Ernest Hemingway, um, and she was a painter. She's a great painter, but because of the misogyny of the era, 
she used the name Peter Miller. So she sold her work under the name Peter Miller. And this is a self-portrait. I actually forget her name. I think her real name is Henry, Henrietta. Yeah, Henrietta. And this is one of her works. Any questions? This is our gory marker. Uh, this is one of the oldest grave sites in Hanover. It's still there. It has some of the, the oldest sites in Hanover from 1700s. A lot of Godbrechts and Kleins and German names. Um, this, is the, this is the only photo of a Civil War exhumation of a soldier that we know of from the Gettysburg campaign. It may, it may actually be one of the, it may be the only photo, I don't know. Um, but this shows a scene in Hanover of an actual soldier being exhumed um, by folks from Hanover and Gettysburg and they, they transported this body or these bodies to Gettysburg for official interment in the Soldiers National Cemetery. So it's hard to see here, but that's an actual corpse being thrusted up from the ground by some type of metal prod. And, there, and there's also a prominent African American, and we think that's him. His name is Basil Biggs, and he's from Gettysburg. And he was an amazing entrepreneur. He was involved in the Underground Railroad, and not, I think he deserves a lot more recognition for his entrepreneurial prowess. And I think he was born a slave and became a freedman. And he actually became quite wealthy late in life. And, and some of it was because of his contracts with folks exhuming bodies from the, uh, the Battle of Gettysburg. Very fascinating man. So this tells the story of the death toll, but also we, we, we can't forget I'm always amazed that, you know, you, you read these stories from John Krebs's book and other sources, the stench of death from horses. I mean, more horses died, many more horses died than men. And I think that story needs to be told over and over and over again, uh, the massive slaughter of living organisms and um, how it wreaked havoc on a community and how do you clean up after that? I mean, the Battle of Hanover is only one day but how it's huge effects on the economy, your lifestyle, your quality of life. It lasts weeks afterward, not to mention the, the trauma and the, and, the, and the memories. Any questions about this one? I'm sorry if I missed this uh, before, but uh, you know, can you talk about the, the total casualty count in the Battle of Hanover? Uh, I'm not sure if you covered that. It's just tremendous, huge for one day. Well, you know, Brandon and I were talking about this the other day, Jim. Um, Jim asked about the total casualty count in Hanover. So before we get to that, it, it amazes me, your county, and, and Jim helped with this, your county produced more than 6,200 soldiers in the Civil War. While no final tally is possible, the number of county men, your county men who died from war wounds and disease was as high as 900. Of that, Hanover's Mount Olivet Cemetery, and I grew up right across from Mount Olivet Cemetery, Mount, Hanover's Mount Olivet Cemetery alone has at least 235 Union graves. Just a, just a, a, a huge number. Not, not all those were from the Battle of Hanover, of course, this, but it seems huge, doesn't it? Uh, you know, the cemetery might have taken casualties from other counties, well, well, course, Northern Maryland, it Adams yeah. County. Just, it seems like a lot, though, doesn't it? It does seem like a lot. Um, so during the Civil War, 620,000 to 750,000 soldiers died. Um, up to 1.5 million equines, equines, that means horses, mules, and donkeys died. Um, in the Battle of Hanover alone, 39 men were killed, two Union officers, 17 enlisted men, and 20 Confederates. The total though, you know, and this is, this is true with any, any battle, right, the Civil War, um, casualties are always much more than dead. And so killed, wounded, and missing in action are typically 
characterize as casualties under that broad rubric of casualties. Casualties in the Battle of Hanover, 343. So you don't really know how many actually died from the wounds because you have disease and, and that, that could linger on for, for uh, days or weeks. But we think, um, according to Kreps and some of the, the really excellent uh, objective historians, the total is probably over 40 in just that little uh, battle, one day battle. Any other questions? <clears throat> now, sir, you asked about the Mao building. So this is from Broadway. This is called Titans of Hanover Industry. And it's interesting how you, you had a little millionaire's row on Broadway in the 19th century, early 20th century. And this is the Mao building. Uh, and Mao was the same company that made the, the brandy and uh, the hemp and the coal and other industries. Um, and Mr. Mao, who's pictured right here, lived next to a Mr. Fitz, and Mr. Fitz uh, made water wheels that were world famous, and he basically created models that made wooden water wheels uh, made out of metal, they're, so they're more durable, more efficient, and it became a, a national phenom and by 1915, Fitz had over 300 such wheels running throughout the nation and Europe. So this is our little uh, millionaire's row on Broadway that looks over towards the Mao Company. So Mao could actually, from his mansion, and this marker is right at the Mao Mansion. You can see the mansion in front of you, and right down the alley is where he worked. And that's not uncommon. <clears throat> Any other questions? This, is, this shows the rebels capturing the square. I talked about the artwork of the 1960s and how it kind of glamorizes the Confederates. This is a, a very interesting painting from 1961 that, that shows the Confederates invading Hanover. And it's, and it's painted by a Hanoverian. And if you notice, it's hard to see maybe from this image, but it almost shows like these ghost riders of Confederates in the background. And it's a very dramatic, um, spiritualized rendering with, the, with the, the Confederate flag fluttering in the wind and these the soldiers stomping, uh, hoofing their way into Hanover. So of all our markers, and we're trying to tell history as straightforwardly as possible, you know, we don't want to glamorize anybody, but we want to tell the truth. And this is kind of a the heyday of what the, the, the Confederacy did in Hanover and how they did thrust through the square, move the Union back, and uh, they did capture, for a brief moment, they did uh, own Hanover. This is on Frederick Street. The first block of Frederick Street, the first two blocks, produced three interesting writers. Um, one was Mary Shaw Leader, who owned the Hanover Spectator after her, excuse me. Who owned the Hanover Spectator after her father, Sennery, died in 1858. There is a local legend. We, don't, we can't confirm it right now. We're still looking for documents. I just found some documents today that might actually validate the story. Um, there's a local mythology that 28-year-old Mary Leader walked to and from Gettysburg, 14 miles away, covered Lincoln's world-famous Gettysburg Address, walked back 14 miles, uh, covered it in a newspaper, and wrote about his few appropriate remarks and how um, how great it was. The, the local legend was that she was one of the only ones to give it a positive review. On further inspection, reviews were very mixed based on the politics of the day. Some people loved it, some people hated it. And, and, these, and we think we have very partisan news now, um, which it is, but the 19th century, my goodness, uh, some of the things they say on the front page of their, their newspaper are really incredible. 
um, polarizing, maligning the other side, calling them all kinds of names. Um, very interesting if you get a chance. And a lot of the Hanover Spectators, which is a pro-Republican, pro-Lincoln paper, um, you can still, through microfiche, read these in the Pennsylvania room of the Hanover Library. Now, John Luther Long, one of my heroes, a very colorful figure, he uh, lived right across the street from where Mary Shaw Leader lived and, and ran her newspaper. John wrote o over 100 short stories. He's a very bohemian uh, type of guy, although he made most of his money um, by being a lawyer, but he had a very dramatic side, and he befriended a very famous theater producer, David Blasco. He penned a short story called Madam Butterfly. It became a stage play before Giacomo Puccini adapted it into a world-famous opera in 1904. John Luther Long, like Mary Shaw Leader, is buried in Mount Olivet Cemetery where those uh, Union soldiers are buried. What's very interesting is Long called himself a feminist, which was um, very ahead of his time. I mean, to call yourself a feminist and a sentimentalist and proud of it. And th that description appears in his New York Times obituary, 1927. Um, very interesting how John Luther Long's version, if you read it, of Madame Butterfly is different than Puccini's um, opera, which became so famous. So Long's original work shows a female lead character, Cho Cho San, a geisha abandoned by her American lover as a survivor who wants to kill herself but ultimately decides otherwise. She lives to raise her child. By contrast, Puccini melodramatically changed the story and the end of Puccini's opera, which became Miss Saigon, if, you, if you've seen the Broadway play, which is really based on Madame Butterfly, Puccini's opera ends with her suicide. Very interesting. Any questions? There's a third historian, George Reeser Prow, um, who wrote an early history of York County. He also lived on that first block of Frederick Street. His history of York County is published in 1907. He's also the first superintendent of the Hanover Public School System. This is a story of the Hanover Telegraph Office and Samuel Trone. You know, your telegraph office during the Civil War was very, very important. It was very, very strategic. The Confederates tried to destroy telegraph offices, and part of Stewart's mission throughout the Mid-Atlantic was to wreak havoc on the North, destroy railroad lines, capture supplies, destroy telegraph offices, because that's really kind of your mode of communication, <coughs> your high-tech mode of communication in 1863. So this gentleman, this very short, delicate, interesting character, Daniel Trone, he stole the telegraph line and actually went to Baltimore to make sure the Confederates did not destroy it. This tells the early part of the battle, mayhem and melees, um, how the Confederates came down Frederick Street. This marker is on Frederick Street, and how everybody's confused. And in, in the heart of the battle, people get confused. The horses are flying everywhere. You're shooting down alleys. You're going down farmland. Sometimes you don't know who the enemy is. Sometimes you don't know which direction you're going or where you're shooting. And we also tell a human interest story this is the Forney Farm on Frederick Street where a lot of the fighting took place. It's also the site of um, where the last known slave in York County, he was known as Old Uncle Sam, or this enslaved individual, the last known enslaved individual, passed away. And we wanted to make a, have a tribute to his human interest story and how the Forney properties and, and their kind of uh, agrarian empire let's be honest, was fueled uh, in large part by the, uh, the slave uh, trade and, and, and work of enslaved uh, individuals. Hey, yes? Okay. So 
This shows, um, we're, we're very proud of this one. This is about Hanover's Underground Railroad. And Hanover, and if you don't get a ch chance, Scott Mingus has a great book, uh, The Ground Swallowed Them Up. To me, it's a landmark book. It's an essential book. And he tells a story about all these different routes throughout York County that freedom seekers took from Eastern York County through Delta, um, through Hanover, and how they made their way north through these kind of circuitous journeys, often always trying to get across the Susquehanna River to go north. And York County has a very proud, to me, history as um, free soil ground. We are free soil. We were north of the Mason-Dixon line. We were a destination for freedom seekers. And Hanover has its own um, underground railroad destination. It's a Jacob Wordhouse. He was a, a merchant in downtown Hanover, very well connected, very wealthy, very prominent family. And there are lots of interesting human interest stories about Jacob Wirt escorting folks down Frederick Street. Jacob Wirt, incidentally, lived on the same blocks that the three writers we talked about earlier. It must have been a very interesting area. This story, by the way, I've talked to a lot of Hanover historians and, and old school historians. Some of them have never even, heard, never heard of this. I mean, I was never taught this when I was a kid. I think it's a very interesting compelling story that must be taught. And um, we must know about all these different journeys and routes to freedom through York County. These are the profiles of Union Courage. General Elon Farnsworth, John Hammond, and we didn't name a street off, uh, off of Hammond. General George Armstrong Custer, who was a big hero in the Battle of Hanover. And Union Private Thomas Burke, He's the first Congressional Medal of Valor uh, recipient for fighting north of the Mason-Dixon line. And that's a, that's a bona fide fact that has never, I don't think has been celebrated nearly enough. Again, we talk about the heroics of the Union Cavalry. This is our, our probably our, the icon of Hanover, which is a picket sculpture on the square we're very proud of that. Um, we talk about how the cavalry's clashed again, Eastern Cavalry Battlefield off of Gettysburg the next day, uh, or actually on July 3rd. And then Custer again, um, bravely led two Union mounted charges and Stuart once again was thwarted. So this is uh, our picket sculpture on the square. It faces almost exactly south if you get your compass out. And it should, because the picket is guarding us, he's protecting us, and he's watching those Confederates to make sure they don't invade once again. So, do I still have a little time? Okay. So I want to thank all our brothers and sisters who have been involved in this from the beginning. Justine Trexus, Main Street, Brandon Winger, L2 Brands, Kat, Katie Kuntz, Jess Mattmuller, Josh Markle, Luke Mummert, all these German names that work at, at, at L2 Brands. It's like a German guild of uh, craftspeople, amazing people. They do tremendous work. I want to thank our siblings of history, our brothers and sisters in history who, who kept us straight through the process. Jim McClure, John Kreps, Scott Mingus Sr., Mark Charisse, Larry Wallace, Ken Weiler, Marvin Muehlhausen of Hanover Historical Society, Wendy Bish and John McGrew of the Pennsylvania Room at the Guthrie Library, my old friend Bruce Reber. So, you know, that's 11 uh, historians right there um, that have helped us crowdsource wisdom, crowdsource facts, make sure what we're saying is accurate to the best of our knowledge and ability based on all the resources available to us. So, in closing, I just want to say that, um, you know, how we map our milestones, how we bear witness to the forces that have shaped us, how we pay homage to the freedoms and dignity of humanity, shows our priorities, builds our communities, and scouts our futures. And um, we're all on, I was talking about the scavenger hunt with my older brother earlier, we're all on a scavenger hunt for our soul. And how are we gonna do that? And we, sh we, we need to do it with honor, with care, with, with uh, dignity, 
and by crowdsourcing what we know and caring and loving the process and the relationships we build along the way. So thanks for being on a scavenger hunt for our soul in our own little way tonight. And thank you for all that you do. Peace. One question. Yeah. This is a great idea for pedestrian and urban areas, but like in West Narrow Township, how can we do a story board and get people to start? Well, I'd love to talk with you about that. There are ways to do it. Um, you can do pocket parks. So, you know, West Wayne has a really interesting history, doesn't it? Yeah. And I can, I can think of at least two sites right now where you could have a point where you either park or, I like places that are bike friendly and automobile friendly, where you create a little stop, you have two or three markers. You know, um, Emmitsburg has done this. You can create a little pocket park um, that welcomes people. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to have 10 parking spaces. You have three to say West Manheim welcomes you. Here's our history. If you want to learn more, here's a website. Uh, here are some resources. And I, th I think, you know, I don't want to talk for Justine and Main Street, but I think, you know, rising tide lifts most boats and we're all in this together. And Stewart's repulsion or his being pushed out of Hanover connects to West Mainheim and connects to downtown Hanover. Let's all tell the story together. Yep. Yes, sir. The, the what history trail? Yeah, history trail. Oh, the grand history trail that I was talking about, the bike trail? Yeah, it does. I, I'd have to do more research with you on that, but um, it's, it's, it certainly does conceptually, okay? And there are parts of the grand history trail that's already been built, like the CNO Canal, you know, the Maryland, D.C. area. Um, if you leave me your, your number or email address, I'll, I'll follow up with you. I'd like to learn that myself. I think they already do gel in Virginia, but we can get it to gel up here in Pennsylvania. Great question. I really appreciated the presentation because um, you can see in your storyboards how balanced you were with your visuals, but then also the research that you did, the maps. But I think what's great about this presentation is that you're also showing that there's a lot of room for contribution, um, not only for the visuals that could be added, and you already have plenty, um, but I like how you're very particular and intentional about what you include in these. Um, and then some of the discussion questions that Matthew and his team came up with, that means that people in the public can share it on Retro York and other Facebook pages, but it's not supposed to be just one directional, it's supposed to be a discussion, and you're very good at that, so thank you. Um, another part I liked about it was, so I'm a social studies teacher, and you say things that we were never taught as a kid, and it's so true, trying to fit everything in and, and trying to instill a love of history so you're always curious and still seeking and just wanting to ask questions but then also answer questions. Um, so you continuing to uncover these stories that would have been forgotten but then also illuminating ways that other people can also become interested and keep on researching. So thank you, it was awesome. Yeah. Um, so join us then next time in three months. We're going to meet the first Thursday in December. It'll be December 3rd. Samantha Dorn will be joining us, and she'll be speaking about her work with the Lebanon Cemetery. So thank you, everyone, that was here in attendance as well as at home. And thank you, uh, History Center and Nicole, for being here with us.